Okay, hi, good morning. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Ernst CISA and ICPP. Ah, nice. Now I can show my smile to you. Good. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. It's only one slide, basically. Basically, uh, the rollergy of nano contact, how it goes and how it behaves. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, so the story begins with this nice experiment from uh, uh, Alessandro Sierra's group in Paris that they had this uh, AFM tip which was injected to a gold substrate and they oscillated to, to make a, a nano junction. Once they made it, then uh, they start oscillating it to, to read the rheology. So they apply this force, this oscillatory force, and they read the uh, amplitude. The, yeah. they, they read the amplitude, and then they divide these two factors by each other, and then they can get the uh, G function, which is the dynamical response function. Uh, so this G uh, has two components, which could be real or imaginary depends if the response function is in phase with the oscillation. The real part is the, the uh, elastic regime and the dissipative part is the imaginary uh, part. So what they observe is uh, uh, quick. So uh, what, what they observe is basically uh, they have the elastic regime here, and the, uh, uh, so the black curve is G prime, and red is G double prime. So at the beginning, for a small oscillation, they have a purely G prime, and once they increase the oscillation, the G prime decreases, and the G double prime, which is dissipation, increases, which is the dis uh, plastic regime. But uh, the important thing here to mention is uh, G uh, is the when they go to larger oscillations, they have that uh, uh, G G prime, which is the elastic response. It goes to a negative value, so that was uh, sort of uh, puzzling, and it could be interpreted as liquid, but it was puzzling because it has the, it is at the room temperature, so it could not be liquid. So to understand it, we we conducted some. Uh, um, MD simulations, and here we have this uh, artificially made nano contact uh, between two slabs, uh, Gordon nano junction. We use Foy's model, and uh, uh, we relax it at room temperature to make some realistic shape of nano contact, which is the one at the right you see, and uh, we did this for different sizes, different junctions uh, the, from the four uh, vertical columns to even more, to 20, 30. Uh, we could do it for different thicknesses. And once we have this, we apply this vertical oscillation, and we read the force. And we only apply thermostat to the upper and lower uh, layers, just to stay away from artifacts in the nano-neck regimes. And uh, if you are interested to, to talk about thermostat, we can do it later. Okay, uh, so uh, in this plot, I'm showing you the oscillation. So the top, uh, the top one is for the small uh, oscillation amplitude, and the more you come down, you see the larger oscillation amplitudes. So the, this blue dashed uh, line is the oscillation amplitude that we apply to the system. And these, uh, these uh, data are the ones that we read from the force between the two slabs. And uh, you see that in the top one, which is the elastic one, uh, if you fit a sinus function on that, that goes like in phase with the oscillation, which means uh, we are in the elastic regime. But once we go lower, we, we, for the lower plot, when there is a larger oscillations, you see that uh, the fit gets a little out of phase, 
And that's exactly what we are looking, uh, looking for. And you see the FIC is not um, also very perfect. So this data could look like uh, random points or random feet. Uh, even in the lower plot, you see there are some uh, mm, strong jumps between this cap of uh, sinusoid, which is displaced upward and downward in wrong position, which uh, this is an important thing I will explain in just in the next slide. Uh, just to give you uh, a reason why we use this is uh, so we can uh, use the Fourier analysis to, for the force data. And uh, we see for the small amplitude, the, the response, the linear response, it, it works well. So, so here you have the frequencies in the horizontal axis. And for the omega zero, which is the frequency of the uh, oscillation, you see you have the main peak. So linear response works very well for here. But if you increase the oscillation amplitude, the linear response doesn't really work. There are many nonlinear terms that it's not easy to get rid of it, but, but we use linear response because we don't have much choice and we want to compare it with the experiment. Um, so let's get to into it. So the, the, the result is here. The picture I'm showing in right is experiment. Uh, again, uh, the black curve is G prime, which is elastic. Red is G double prime, which is the uh, dissipative uh, response. Uh, this is done uh, on, on the nano neck of size 11. Size 11 means 11 chain of atoms in the section. Um, we did it also for the more or less the same thickness, but we could not do for uh, 30 kilohertz because we computed that's not possible. But because we are very brave people, so we tried the 10 gigahertz. <laughs> So 10 gigahertz, uh, and without any adjustment on the numbers, any uh, normalization, you see, <laughs> it more or less works. So it, it gives right results. But so at the beginning, I thought the, the, this is some wrong things should be threw it away. Then so we tried lower frequencies. So we did also one gigahertz, and it still it works. And uh, we did even lower. We, we did uh, 100 megahertz. And still, there is there's good agreement with the experiment. Uh, we, we push it harder. We go 50 megahertz and uh, even 10 megahertz. And because the referee pushed us, we did also 1 megahertz. <laughs> but I didn't put it here. <laughs> anyway, so the message here is this is frequency independent. This response looks frequency independent. And the puzzling thing is you have G prime negative even in the simulation. So something should, uh, should be understood. Um, so what's going on? <laughs> uh, I think the, all the mystery is hidden in this picture. This is force versus oscillation amplitude. And the, um, there are well, to translate this plot, maybe in your mind, this is like stress-strain curve. So something that everybody knows, I think. Uh, what we have here, uh, you see in the middle, there is this uh, elastic regime. When the nanojunction looks like that, and then you oscillate it a little bit, you get the linear uh, response. So that's uh, expected. But once you elongate it, uh, hardly, then you see it goes to, it gets very narrow. It's called the necking regime. And uh, once you compress it, it goes very fat, which is the, which we call it bellying regime. But uh, there is a two interesting factor here. First, is this uh, fatting and narrowing in necking and bellying thing is not occurring slowly. So it's, it's like very sharp transitions. It's a stick and slip that translates necking to bellying regime, and which we try to show with that uh, gray zigzag thing on top of the data. And uh, mm, yeah, that's the important thing. And that's what it makes it frequency independent. The other important thing 
is the average of this plot is not zero. The average is always tensile. And that comes from this nice work of uh, Eriot Osatia, the uh, year 2000, which I was maybe a little kid. And uh, at that time, they showed the, this is the string tension. So this uh, non uh, gold nano contact, the nano wire, they always have this string tension. Well, what it means, it means when the nano contact is very narrow, it tends to break. There is some tendency to break it. And when it's fat in the belling regime, it tends to, to collapse the two slab and make it, make it a whole bulk. So that's the important thing. Um, yep, that's all we need to know. Uh, but how this would result in negative G prime? In order to do that, we use uh, some simple, very simple model, the toy model we, we do here, uh, which we call it zigzag model, which uh, we, am, we apply this sinusoid um, oscillatory thing, which is a strain, so oscillatory strain, and we do this as a stress. We read this as a stress. So the first term is the linear term. Uh, the first term is the linear, which is always should be there. The second and the third term, we added for this bellying jump and the necking jump with JB and JN, which they only enter to the game when the oscillation amplitude is big enough to, to do so. And the last term is the string tension, which is some average value to elevate this, uh, uh, the average of the plot, which I show you it was not there. So at the end, this is the function of the stress versus the strain, a zigzag. If J is zero, you have the perfect line. And if J is not zero, you get these uh, jumps at this necking and belling regime. Um, okay. So here I, I use j the same for necking and belling. I use the same value, just for simplicity. So what we want is g prime, for, which for this system would be the ratio between Fourier transform of uh, stress relative to strain. And we we do this Fourier transform and we calculate the g prime, and we see that for this very simple model. If J is long enough, G prime goes negative, as simple as that. So I think these two uh, elements that I just told you is all, all you need to have G prime negative. And I think that uh, that explains the story. Um, but you, you should remember, the jump should be big enough to touch the zero level. So that means there should be a strong jump that relieves the stress, relieves the stress when it goes to belling and um, necking regime. So it's like there is a stress, but there is this sudden jump, sudden slips, which are usually FCC, HCP sleeping layers because they are closing energy. And it relieves the uh, stress for a moment, and that's, that's all is needed. Uh, even it can be understood from the slope of that plot, you see, if you, those, uh, uh, I don't know if it's clear, this G prime thing, if you, if you put away uh, some very rush um, average on the slope, you see it turns slowly negative once you include these jumps. That, that's all the story. Uh, but, so we said frequency independent. But how long this is frequency independent? If you go with one hertz, is it still doing this? this? So to understand that, we, we estimate the, this crossover frequency. Using uh, transition state theory, uh, we, 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 from the simulation, we estimated this energy barrier for these jumps. And we, we took the system when it was in bellying regime. We, we didn't oscillate it, we just fixed the uh, the height of these two slabs, and uh, but, uh, then what? Yes, then we, we simulated for a long time. Then there are some attempts to unbuilding this system. 
what we did, we, uh, we used Fourier transform uh, to, to, to analyze the signal in this unbelieving regime. And we got a frequency, some attempt frequency like 10 megahertz. Using this attempt frequency, uh, we can get very rough estimation for this uh, crossover frequency, which is like 600, meg 600 hertz. This is interesting for experimentalists here. If they can try, they will see uh, in some frequency close to that, we predict that uh, there would be some viscose sliding and uh, which may be, be linear with frequency. This is interesting to see. Um, so the last slide I show here, um, the, the motivation for this is the other day, some of the professor here had some, asked some questions. Uh, if uh, there is liquid, if, is it even possible to have liquid between the nanojunctions? So we failed to do it in simulation. We couldn't see a liquid between, between junctions and simulations. It's really tricky and hard to maintain it. But we could do instead, we could increase the temperature to increase the mobility and somehow mimic uh, some very mobile uh, material in between. So in this uh, plot I'm showing you here is a nanonic lifetime versus temperature. You see if you, uh, so that's our simulation limit. You see around one microsecond. Uh, when you uh, go to the lower temperature, then the lifetime of a nano neck, of course, increases. We predict that room temperature, they, they can exist like one second or something. But this is a strong argument that uh, in experiment, it's so what has been observed or what could be, it's not liquid because liquid would really break before experimental feedback time. So the, the shadow I'm showing you is the experimental feedback time that they use to read the force signal, and then they adjust the piezo to, to do, I don't know, some experimental stuff to, to adjust the strain and the stress and things. But the lifetime of a liquid nanonic, we predict is shorter than the uh, feedback time scale. So I think it, it's, it's not really doable to have liquid, uh, but still would be interesting if it's, if, if any experimenters can show that, so. Yep, so that's all, that's the, all the story in one picture. Questions? <laughs> Yes, I will show you. Hi, you know, we already discussed a bit uh, at the post session, yes. but it's still just me not understanding enough. Uh, uh, so what is the negative oscillation amplitude? Because if it's just like, like what, what I, what I very, think very it is, good, very good I would question. expect a symmetric uh, response, for example, in slide seven. Very good question. So the, neg the negative response is the tendency of the non-contact to be oscillated. And the reason of that, I think, is the string tension. Because once you go to this story, when you pass this uh, crucial value of the oscillation amplitude, you make a neck, and the non-contact wants to break. Then you get a belly, the non-contact wants to Ah, I do not have the, what? Ah, the so negative oscillation here means compression, sorry. Compression and positive means expansion. No, at each point we have oscillation amplitude. Is the displacement. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is a displacement. Okay.
more questions. In the meantime, I try to show you movies. I still have 10 seconds. <laughs> Thanks for, for the talk. Actually, if you keep increasing the amplitude, then you are going to get back to positive, uh, positive moduli, right? Uh, I'm sorry? If you keep increasing the amplitude, then in your six up thing, you are going to have go back to, to sort of a positive response on your... But very good, very good question. Um, the nanocontent would break before that, but I think you, you might be right. The, the, the misconception is trying to apply linear rheology to something that is non-linear, right? We shouldn't. Um, no, I mean, uh, uh, okay, I understand the linear response is not enough for this story, but still you will have the force negating your oscillation, right? So I, I have no idea what would happen if you use non-linear response. But uh, the, I mean, the thing that you see, it's a physical thing. So it's not that if you use some uh, nonlinear response, then. I guess my point is that the positive on having a negative G prime is just that you are going too far. I mean, for the thing, understanding the experiment, if you go too far, maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense. I think, yeah. Maybe some new module should be deep developed for this story. So that is true. Yes, we measure the noise. Yes, and we do the, which is not only. And I think I showed it here. Yes, this plot. This is the noise. We we do the Fourier transform of the noise. And you see here, for a small amplitude, you have the peak at the frequency of uh, oscillation. But for large amplitude, you get peak at the almost, I don't know, for 10, 12 harmonics. So. But still, uh, coffee break, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, thank you. I think we come back uh, 11.20, huh?